Okay, we're going to uh, look at Genesis 16. We're going to be, I'm going to read a couple, of the first two verses to you, if you'll turn there with me. And then we'll get into the message. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an, Egypt, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord, i turn my page here, the Lord has received, Restrain me from bearing. I pray thee, go in and unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Uh, so, Lord, we just uh, humble ourselves today before you. We thank you for all your your love and your grace. We thank you for the examples we have in Scripture that we can learn so much from and glean from. And Lord. We just pray today that you open up our hearts and minds and that you will just impart what we need to understand about our own faith walk before you. And we just praise you for all the many blessings you've given us and for this opportunity to meet together and partake of the word together. And we just say this in your precious name. Amen. Last week, we, we talked about how God established Abram's real reward, which was God himself. And he gave him a token of his promise, which required Abram to become part of the covenant through sacrifice. Up until this time, it's all one-sided. And yes, Abram believed it, but he never entered in totally into that covenant with God until the sacrifice was made. And that was showing that he was coming into agreement. Covenant involves cutting, so it often ends in sacrifice. And you know the, the story about the blood brothers. It's the same concept of agreement together in a very unique way. That's what the covenant pointed to. But when it comes to the faith walk, the first thing you have to be aware of, people, and this is so important, that once God establishes a matter by revealing his plan, the next thing that falls is temptation. And temptation is a testing, okay? And it always follows. We want it all to fall into place when God shows us things, our calling, our election, whatever we want to. But guess what comes? It's that temptation, that temptation. And so what we're going to see is the temptation. And this is very important to follow this because you can see yourself in Sarai. A lot of people, you know, we'd like to give her a bad time. But you know what? She fell the same test many of us have felled. And we're going to talk about that pretty soon here. And so temptation always follows. Now, God established that the heir would come out of Abram's loins. Remember, he offered his servant. And last week, I stated that this event had to be at least 10 or 11 years after he left his homeland to do what God wanted him to do. And, and one thing about it is when the faith walk enables you to walk with your limited understanding because you cannot see the eternal perspective of anything. You have to trust God with the eternal perspective and you have to be faithful to walk out what you already know by faith. And basically, that is a real, that's how the faith walk gets you to the end where you can embrace your promises, the promises of God. Now, the more you realize that you cannot bring a matter about, the more you realize that it's impossible, it's when you run out options that guess what? That's when God steps on the scene. And you know what he's doing here? He's getting it where they run out of options. I'm going to talk about this more because it's all through here. Because we always have our options. I'm sure nobody has your options, right? Uh, as to how maybe things can work out. And it's only when we've run out of our options that God steps on the scene and we truly become a real candidate for God to show himself mighty through us. Because about that time, we're a weak, useless vessel. 
And that's where God wants us. Now, here's the problem. And I know this is true because I've done this to God. Man often puts a time element on God. Okay? And he bases it on his strength, on his abilities, on the events that he sees going on around him. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up when all this Jesus coming back, the rapture was a big thing. And... Most of you might remember the 1988 88 reasons God was come back in night. I mean, Jesus was come back in 1988. He didn't come back. And I don't know how many of you remember, but the year 1996 was the year of the beast. And so everybody felt that the beast was going to be exposed. In other words, the Antichrist. So all these stipulations have been put on when Christ is coming back. So we have a tendency, and here's how it works. God gives you a promise, and so you say, okay, this has to happen before this, 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 because I will be too old, I would be too pathetic to carry it out. So if God, if you don't do it in this time period, you're out of luck. It's not going to happen. You know how we look at it? So we put this time frame on God based on us, based on our, our strength, our abilities to get it carried out. But guess what God's waiting for when those things aren't there? So it gets us to the point where whatever happens is going to be an impossible task and only God can do it because I can't do it. I don't have the strength. I don't have the means. I don't have anything. And this is where he's getting not only Abram, he's especially getting Sarai there. He has to get her there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so uh, here we come to this real time that guess what? There comes this temptation. Now it takes faith, people, to endure the preparation that God takes a person through before he brings forth his promises. You know that preparation is about getting you out of the way? That preparation is about just totally having all your options fall off, off the cliff there into the abyss. And there's nothing left but God. There's nothing left but God. And then you say to yourself, if God wills this, then he's the only one that's going to be able to do it. And we have a tendency to think, before we get to that point, oh, well, you know what? I can help God along. Isn't that how we think? Now, I thought that way. But God has to bring us through a preparation. And it's that faithfulness and endurance that enables the person to wait upon the Lord. But guess what? That waiting is the hardest test of all. That waiting is a time of preparation. Who wants to wait? And the more you wait, the more you see your strength and your abilities and all the things that you thought were possible began to go out with the sea of time, don't we? That's basically what it comes down to. But that's okay. Anyway, that's what we are coming down to here. Because... Uh, Sarai is going to be looking at all of this stuff and she's going to uh, realize that nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. God's not bringing in, uh, you know, the solution. He's not showing himself. And so she's at this place. Now, please hear what happens. In the time of waiting, which is the grace test, this is when a person has a tendency to become impatient with God's timing. I'm sure you can't imagine that, right? Impatient with God's timing, okay? Uh, because you don't see anything happen. And so you begin to look around for the solution instead of patiently looking upwards and trusting God with the solution. And you become anxious as you look look around instead of look up. 
because you are losing that expectation that God's going to bring about because he hasn't brought it about according to your timing. You are looking at everything and the obstacles are getting bigger, not smaller. And that's what happens. We see the obstacles get bigger instead of smaller. So at this point, you're thinking, man, God made this promise, and, you know, it's got to come about. So we, in our logic, we begin to look around for solutions, okay? Because we're just going to help nudge it along a little bit. Because after all, God needs help, right? Now let me tell you this much. Anytime man gets involved with trying to work it out, you know what he ends up doing? Accepting the counterfeit. He ends up selling for less. And a counterfeit will always be waiting in the background to take center stage. And that's what you have to understand. A counterfeit is very, very patient. And they're waiting for their timing. Do you realize that in America, what we call the inner core or the world planners have been waiting for a time when America's environment would allow them to put the biggest imposter in the office of the United States presidency. His name is Obama, and they did it because the American environment has been prepared to accept the counterfeit. When they were looking at the situation with uh, B George Bush, they were becoming anxious. America was becoming anxious because we weren't going forward. Give us a solution. Give us a solution. And the word pl world planner says they'll, they'll accept the imposter. They'll accept the counterfeit. Because they'll accept anything right now. And that's exactly what's happened. Because you know why? When you get involved, guess what goes down the tube? Your discernment, your standards... You're going to be prepared to compromise is what you're going to do. You're not going to hold up the, uh, that high standard because it's not the standard anymore that's important. It's getting the solution. It's, it's taking care of this that's irritating you or taking care of something that isn't changing anything. And you know what? I'm going to tell you this right now. We've walked the faith walk. That is where God's going to get you. He's going to get you desperate. And that's where the test comes in for every one of us. Are we going to do it our way and accept the counterfeit? Or are we going to wait for what God has for us? We have to make up our mind. Because I'll tell you something. Anytime a counterfeit's involved, it's going to be a disaster. Now, we see that Sarai was tempted in this way. <clears throat> She was past the age of childbearing, and she felt that God had kept her from having children, okay? So she felt there was something there between her and God, most likely, because it was really uh, a very bad thing for women to be barren in those times. And they felt it was a punishment from God a lot of times. And so she looked at this, she says, I'm, I'm getting past the age of childbearing, and uh, God has kept uh, me from having a child. And so she felt the need to help God along the way, using the cultural accepted practice of giving the slave in your place. And that was accepted in those days. And so she went to Abram, and the logic seemed reasonable enough to Abram, especially since Sarai was open and willing to offer her slave and her place to bring about God's promise. 
After all, there was no other way, right? And he hearkened unto her voice. Now, it's clear that Sarai was operating in unbelief. We can see that. And you have to realize she believed God as far as Abram having descendants. But she could not see herself as the vessel in which God would accomplish such a task. After all, God had kept children from her. It must have been a reason for that. Maybe she was being punished. We don't know how she thought, really. But what she didn't realize is that God brings forth the matter in his timing when man cannot have any part in it. When man is finally totally to that point where he's bankrupt and the only one that's going to change the whole scenario is God himself. Sarai wasn't there yet because she still had her options. And people, as long as we have our options, that's what we're going to naturally fall back on. All our logic, all of our reasoning. Now, God's timing may not fit in man's logic or his time frame, but it, his timing ensures that when it's brought forth, it is God's doing and not man's doing. That's what's going to be sure of. No man is going to get glory or credit for it because it's going to take a supernatural act on God's part to bring it forth. Therefore, only God gets the glory. That's what people don't understand. You see, faith allows God to bring you there and you still trust his character that no matter what, he's going to bring forth his promises. It doesn't matter what you see or don't see on the horizon. God's going to bring forth his promise. I believe that. See, that's what faith enables you to walk through. But you have to put your trust on God to do that. And Sarai was looking at the whole thing and said, look, it can't come through me, so it has to come through somebody. This handmaiden of mine, she's my servant, she can represent me. And of course, Abram said, okay. After all, his wife suggested it, right? In the end, God would receive the glory. And that is what Sarai didn't understand. And as we see, when man gets involved in it, what happens? Because man begins to take the glory, is what happens. And we're going to see that. Now, when God does something, it's always according to his, to somebody's complete surrender. In other words, the vessel surrender that it has come to a complete place of weakness. And therefore, when that happens, God's grace, what well, is begins, and out comes his timing, his plan, and the fulfillment of his promises. Now, we see this in the case of another son. Remember, Abram was going to have an heir, but it wasn't, as, as Sarai looked at it, it wasn't going to happen according to her because her timing was past. That's how she looked at it. And so there's another son that came forth, not according to man's will, not according to man's timing, but according to God. And we read about this in John chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses... 11:13. This is Jesus this time. I came un unto his own, and his own received him not. But listen to what it says. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now this is a big one, 13. Which were born not of blood... In other words, he didn't come from the loins of man, nor of the will of the flesh. It wasn't man involved, nor the will of man, but of God. And this was going to be the same thing for Isaac, by the way. Isaac is a type of Christ in this way. And 
you know, people were looking for the Messiah then, and how many people came on the scene and claimed they were the Messiah? Aren't we having that today again? Now, let's look at what it says back at uh, 16. We're going to find out how long, how, what length of period that we're talking about since Abram left. It does tell you, and you will see my calculations were pretty right on, but I had to go backwards to get it. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. Now, she was from Egypt. And who did uh, the children of Israel later become slaves to? Egypt. After Abram had dwelt, how long? Ten years in the land of Canaan. Ten years. And he gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Ten years he had been there. Now, the number ten means perfect order. It means perfect order. And that's a very important number to realize. Because why was it perfect order? Because everything was in order. Abraham was now involved with the, in the covenant with God. Uh, Sarai was, uh, you know, in line, but she didn't understand that. It was in order, the way God intended it. Everybody was in their proper places, right? Now consider this. We're going to look at this. The problem is when man puts his two cents in, God's perfect order is disrupted. I want you to know, when you get in there to try to help God, you're going to disrupt his order. You're going to disrupt it. That's why you keep your hands off of it and trust God with the details. So let's look at what 4a says. And he went unto Hagar, and she conceived. Okay, now here comes the... The supposedly heir. Now, how, if he was born within nine months of ten years, he probably was, what, the eleventh year he was born. The eleventh year. You know what the eleventh year represents? In perfect order. It is one number short of perfect government. Does that give you any idea what's about to occur? In perfect order, one short of perfect government. Now, did this matter and in an imperfect order? And if so, how did it manifest itself? Good question. Look at 4B because we're going to see the result. And he went unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was what? Despised in her eyes. Now we're beginning to see disruption of God's perfect order. Now you've got to understand how they looked at everything in those days. We have a hard time relating to it. But let me explain how uh, imperfect order manifests itself. It manifests itself in a blatant disre disregard or disrespect of authority. That's how it manifests itself. All order is kept in line by authority. Every authority, every point of authority is in its right place. When you move that authority out of the right place, that's when you get this imperfect order because chaos steps in. Because it's that perfect order that keeps chaos from stepping in. When we look at our government, they situated three branches of government that keep check and balance so there would be no branch of government exhorting authority, exceptional authority over the other two. Because then you would cause a disruption of order. And that's what we're seeing today. And wherever there's disruption of order, it means there's lawlessness. 
because disregard towards authority means you do not honor or respect the laws. You don't respect the order of society. Today we have a disruption of family because children are not taught to respect the authority of their parents. As a result, they don't respect the authority of society, the police. And if you don't respect the authority of society, you don't respect the government officials over you. If you don't respect the government officials, you're not going to recognize and respect God's authority. It is a domino effect. And it fails right at the home, usually. Because when a home is out of order, you will see society begins to fall out of order. And when society falls out of order, then governments fall out of order. So here we have this disrespect uh, of authority, meaning Hagar, a servant, disrespecting the authority of her mistress or owner. Now, what was she thinking? Well, she'd be probably thinking what most arrogant young women would be thinking. She was thinking, by the way, her name might give you some idea, it means midday flight, a stranger that fears. Okay? And you have to remember, Hagar was a servant, and she was never to replace Sarai, but to represent her. And her attitude is that she was all of a sudden, because she was now with child, the heir in her mind, she was replacing Sarai. In other words, she figured and assumed that Abram would prefer her over Sarai because she was uh, pregnant. Now, that would be natural, don't you think? Except that's not how it worked in those cultures. It didn't matter if the servant was pregnant. She was still a servant. She was still property. She was still a slave. Her status did not change. What her status did was give the possibility of her son being an heir instead of a slave. But she would always be a slave. That's how the culture had it. Here's the other point that you have to remember. Sarai would have to designate this child as heir. If she didn't designate him as heir, he would still, he would be a slave. It all really hinged on Sarai because she was the owner of the slave. She wasn't Abram's slave. She was Abram's wife's slave. He had no say over it. That's why we're going to see how he handled it. So here's this blatant lawlessness, disrespect. That she thinks she sees herself as becoming preferred one to Abram exalted above her owner. And this made for an improper order because now the servant thought she could call the shot. She didn't have to respect her mistress. That now she was the preferred one. But you see, Abram's wife was still her owner. And God had not changed the order at all. Culture did not change the order at all. Abram had not changed the fact that, guess what? He still preferred his wife over the slave. That had not changed. But she didn't, she didn't get that. Because she thought this baby had changed her identification and her status.
as I said, the unborn child's inheritance would be determined by uh, the owner and not by Abram or his mother. It was not in Abram's court to call it. It all had to do with how his wife looked at it. Now that's very much to keep in mind when you're looking at all this. The true identification of the promised one. We're talking about Isaac being the promised one. The heir, in other words, we're talking about the heir, would be established by woman and not by man. That's something to think about. After all, and this is the reason why, the promised one would come through the seed of woman and not for man. The seed of woman and not for man. And we're getting another representation here. The woman would be the vessel for the seed. That's all Hagar was, Hagar. She was a vessel for the seed of the promised one to be brought forth. She would represent Abram's wife, not replace her. There's a big difference. And through her, she would be the vessel in which this promised seed would come forth. That's what was meant to be. But she took it that she was the great one. So here you have this woman would be the vessel for the seed. Now the per first promised son, Isaac, would come from a barren vessel. The second promised one would come from a virgin. It's all pointing to this, but both would require God's miraculous intervention to bring forth that seed. And it was outside of man's ability to do anything, including Abram. Man's part, at best, especially even with Abram, was very limited because God would have to do it. So let's look at 5. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be up on thee. Because let's look at 4. She knew that her, her servant was despising her now. And so she says to Abram, My wrong be up on thee. Thee I have given my maid unto thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. She's asking Abram for a judgment call at this time. But notice what she said. She admitted that the imperfect order now existed was her fault. It was her fault. And it was her fault because she got impulsive and got ahead of God. She got ahead of God, didn't she? And how many times do we do that? The slave now felt superior to her mistress because she forgot her place. People, we forget our place. And when we do, we often forget the grace of God in the process. Now, this woman was still Sarai's property and had to answer to her. And one of the things you have to understand is we are all born slaves, aren't we? We're all born slaves to sin. We must recognize our status in order to change our state. And that's very important. As soon as this servant forgot she was a servant, because she thought her status was changed, she failed to recognize her state wasn't changed. In other words, her inward thinking and her way of recognizing that she still was a servant. She still was a slave no matter what. We must recognize our status in order to change our inward state. And Hagar assumed her pregnancy would change her status but she was still a slave. The challenge for we, all of us is which master will we serve to choose? Which master will we serve to choose? Which master will she choose to serve? Let's 
see what happened to her, okay? Because in, in verse 5, uh, Sarai is saying, saying to Ab Abram, now you make a judgment. But Abram said unto Sarai, in other words, choose, okay? Said, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it please. Boy, she really had a lot of clout with Abram, didn't she, the servant? He says, You do as you please with her. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So do you think she was uh, really gentle with her? What do you do with foolishness? The Bible says you take a real rod to it. Because foolishness doesn't get it any other way. And this young lady was foolish. And so she fled. I mean, that was pretty bad. Where was Abram and all that? <laughs> Bye. So this foolish slave rightfully paid the consequences for her attitude. Abram was not committed to the slave, even though she was pregnant with his child. He was still very much committed to his wife. One of the things you have to learn is you never foolishly test the loyalties of honorable people because they will always choose the honorable, orderly way. His wife was not out of order. The slave girl was. And when you come up to an honorable person like Abram, they're going to say, you're out of order. So I have to choose the honorable way. You pay the consequences. And that's how it works. They will choose the way of order. Because if he let this lady all of a sudden step on his wife, what kind of order would they have in their camp? What would that be saying to the rest of the slaves? You can't have it. You cannot have that type of rebellion without causing rebellion to raise up in others. You have to deal with that rebellion in the way that the other slaves know their place too. One of the things about Jesus coming back uh, and reigning in the millennium, do you know what he's going to use to reign with? An iron rod. It points to real chastisement against any, any disobedience or lawlessness. It's not going to be a, a slight tap. It's going to be an example to everybody else who disobeys and rebels. Because that's the only way you can keep foolish man in line. Whether we like it or not, that's the way it is. So we see her fleeting. But you know something? God wasn't through with this slave, her unborn child. Praise the Lord. He's just got tremendous grace. Let's look at seven. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. The angel of the Lord. Now, who was this? Was it just a messenger? In other words, an angel? Or was it Jesus in his pre-incarnate state? talking to her. The word, the communicator of God. We're going to find out here probably uh, in a, just a little bit. But he met her. And I want you to see what he does here. And he said, hey, Hagar, Sarai is my, whence comest thou? And where will thou go? He asked her a question. <laughs> where have you come from? Where are you going? Now, do you think this messenger didn't know, sort of, where she was doing? He, he knew. Here's the key. Hagar needed to know. She needed to know where she was, where she came from. She was a slave. Where she was going was nowhere. Okay? But he was causing her to think about it, because until a person, okay, realizes where they're at, you can't instruct them. You cannot instruct them. This messenger could have not instructed Hagar until she realized where she was at. She came from this place where she was a slave, but she was taking care of where is she going. She has nowhere to go. 
She's a slave. She would be taken in as a slave again. That's the only way it would work. And so he's throwing this at her so she will take instruction from him. Because when you're in rebellion and being foolish, do you take instruction? No. It's only when you suddenly realize, oh, well, this isn't doing too well. I've just paid consequences. Where am I going from now? I'm still a slave. So what did he tell her? Because at this time, look at where she, she says to him. She says, uh, I fled from the face of my mistress, Saria. Okay, she didn't say I was a real jerk and got in trouble and fled. But she admitted that she fled from her mistress, okay, the one who owned her. Look at what the angel of the Lord says to her. This he gives her a command. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and do what? Submit my, thyself under her hands. Come back into order. Period. You have to go back and you have to face it. Because you have no future outside of your mistress. And your child has no future. So she had to do something that she did not want to do. She'd have to swallow her pride, admit that she was a slave, and go back to her mistress and Noah. And submit to her rule in order to bring back order. But here's the important thing. She did it. Okay, we know she did it. The angel of the Lord knew she was going to do it. So with this instruction comes a promise. Ten. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for the multitude. Then he goes on to say, And the angel of the Lord, in verse 11, said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. Did Abram give this promise, this son, a name? No. When you see Hagar was calling that son name based on her encounter with the Lord and what he told her. But Ishmael means God hears, the Lord hears, he hears the Lord, okay? And so, and that's what he's saying, I hear your affliction right now, you're going to bear a son, you're going to name him Ishmael. What a promise. But we're about to see how this imperfect order will manifest itself. It will manifest itself in her descendants. That's where we're really going to see the imperfect order. The one born according to the will of man. In fact, this imperfect order was set up descendants that would prove to be wicked, and we see the results today in the descendants of what? ISIS, some of those descendants are there. Guess who they're fighting against? All Saudi Arabia, all those places are those descendants. Now look and hear what he says to her because he tells her the future, the disposition of this man she's going to give birth to. Verse 12, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. Isn't that what we're seeing today? And every man's hand against him. Not popular, that's for sure. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. How many of you know that the Islamic religion calls Ishmael their father and not Isaac? And they're right. 
They are living according to prophecy. A wild man will never be a spiritual man. He is untamed, he's fleshly, he's of the earth. Now here we are giving insight into the messenger itself. Let's look at 13. And she called the name of the Lord. Wow. She sees him as Jehovah that speaks unto her. And then she says, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? In other words, I looked on God. She understood who she was seeing. She was seeing Christ in his pre-incarnate state. Wherefore, the well was called Bir Allah Roy. That's quite a name, but what it means, I'm going to tell you what it means here. It means a well or fountain of the living, of the living. And there's only one living God that we have, but it's a fountain of the living. It was between Kadesh and Bera in the wilderness. Now, 15, and Hagar bear Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bear Ishmael. So that was passed on. No doubt either God told him or the woman told him what happened to her. So he confirmed that name, but it was given to woman first. And then it came down to man. Who gave Jesus, who got, who received the name of Jesus first? Woman. So it's not unusual. And so it often comes down. Uh, who received the name of John the Baptist first? His mother. His father didn't believe. And then he says, do what his mother says. There's a lot going on here. But it was passed to woman first. And then a man complied, of course, in the case of Abram, he did what was right. Now, Abram was 86 years old, okay, and we're going to see this. And Abram was four score, four score means he was 80, because you take a score, it's 20 years, four of them would be 80, and he was 86 years old. He left when he was 75. And so it was, what, 11 years into his journey that Ishmael was born. The imperfect order, falling short of perfect government. And so through Isaac comes Jacob and his 12 sons of perfect government. But first comes the imperfect order to challenge what is perfect. The counterfeit always comes first, people, before the real thing. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because the Antichrist will come first before Jesus comes. That has always been the way things work. So in our phone condition, our lives represent imperfect order. The proper authority is missing from those people who never come to Christ because of sin and God is missing from their lives. We all have to realize that we have been identified as slaves from the very beginning, beholden to a certain master. But we have to choose which master we're going to serve, sin or God. We cannot always avoid people paying the consequences for sin, but we can avoid paying the wages for it, which is death. It's because of the true seed of woman, Jesus Christ, that our status has changed. But we must be identified. And what I mean, it's been changed from slave to children, from servant to friend. Okay, that is what Jesus really wants, is that friendship. Remember, Abraham, as we will see, was called a friend of God. That's where he really wants us to come. But because of the seed of woman, Jesus Christ, our status has changed. But we have to be identified to the promised seed, the promised son, Jesus Christ, for us to avoid the consequences and the wages 
of sin.